Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. Matthew 5, 17 to 20. That's on page 1455. 1455. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you'll certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Max Pringle was a little worried uh, when he saw the sermon outline at the West Church because he was thinking we might have a PE after church and try and run a mile in four minutes. Uh, let me tell you, that's harder than it looks, but it's happening more and more, uh, the four-minute mile. Uh, last year in America, the greatest number of athletes broke the four-minute mile. There's a random fact that won't stand you in any good use whatsoever. Uh, but over a period of time, people have wondered whether you can run four laps of a track in under four minutes. Uh, if you like figures, 1.609344 kilometres. Uh, the debate raged for many decades around the move from the 1800s to the 1900s. Uh, runners uh, were described as participating in the sport of pedestrianism. And uh, they were divided into amateurs and professionals and the two weren't allowed to compete against each other. Uh, the professionals held the record until the amateurs kind of drew even in 1915. And 1930 transformed the pursuit of the four-minute mile. Uh, in the 1930s, you had the advent of the newsreel footage and the four-minute mile actually became an obsession, whether we like it or not, for the whole globe. Did you realise that in the 1930s, that actually that was the fascination, breaking the four-minute mile? Uh, the leader at that point was a man called Jack Lovelock from New Zealand and his great rival was Glenn Cunningham from America. They were both men a little shorter than me, if it's possible, uh, stockier than me, if it's possible, and they reduced the mile to four minutes and six seconds in the 1930s. In the 1940s, the Swedes came along. Did you know the, the Swedes were dominant distance runners in the 40s? And two men, Anderson and Haag, uh, kind of salami sliced the record down to four minutes and one second by 1945. After that, there was a decade of no change. That was a reasonable reason. There was the Second World War. The whole world was actually focused on really important things. Uh, and in fact, most of the athletes had died, been damaged in the war. But the debate was reignited. And for nearly a decade, there were attempts around the globe to try and break the four-minute mile. But the record stood at four minutes, one second, point four. Uh, people began to think it wasn't going to happen. There were all these expectations, but every attempt fizzled until May the 6th, 1954, in Oxford at the Ifley Road track at 6pm. During an university meet, Bannister, Roger Bannister, lined up in a six-man field. He'd organised two friends, Chris Chataway and Chris Brasher, to be his pacers. Chat uh, Bannister was a medical student. He'd spent the day in studies, hopped on the train and got to the track. Chataway took them out, and by the time they got to the halfway point, they were at 1 minute 58 seconds. It was doable. But they'd been at this place before. Brasher took over. He got them through to one lap to go, right on three minutes. And then Bannister did the rest. He closed in 59 seconds. All the track was waiting because there were no public time records at that point. And the announcer knew the tension, so he stretched it out and stretched it out. But when he got to, and the winning time was three, no one heard the rest. All pandemonium broke loose. The barrier had been broken, the myth had been shattered. Bannister had broken the four-minute mile. 
Now, the debate's continued, and the debate has changed because even high school athletes in America now run the mile in under four minutes. It's never going to happen for me. The debate now rages as where does Bannister fit amongst all these middle distance runners? Where, where do we slot him? We, we like to rank people, don't we? Work out where they stand and where they fit. Uh, he's actually, of all the mile record holders, the one who held it for the shortest amount of time, only 46 days, until an Australian broke it in Turku in Finland, John Landy. He's actually nowhere near the current record, which stands at three minutes, 43 seconds. It's been nearly a decade since Hikam El Garouj, a Moroccan, broke the record. Bannister never won an Olympic medal, let alone a gold medal. Bannister never created any revolutionary training method. He was no one to invent a new running suit or outfit or shoes. His training was pretty average. His career was impressive. I mean, the high point was beating Landy at the mile of the century at the Commonwealth Games where he won the gold medal. And in fact, when Bannister was interviewed about his greatest achievement, he didn't even mention the four-minute mile. He mentioned all the medical techniques he'd pioneered as a neurologist. Where does he fit? Now, there's no doubt that Bannister didn't do something new. Everyone else was doing the same training and many were doing more. Many others had come very close and, in fact, within 46 days, Landy showed that he could shatter the record. So what did he do? Well, he actually stood on the shoulders of everyone who'd come before. He didn't do something new, but he did something greater, didn't he? Not something new, but something greater. He was at the pointy end of all those years that had come before him, after the barrier was broken, there was a new running landscape and the mile record tumbled to where it is today. If you like, he didn't do something new, he did something greater. He stood at the centre point between old running and new running. I think Jesus is the same, isn't he? Except the stakes are far higher than how fast you can run four laps. Let me pray and we're going to look at it together. Dear God, thanks for your word. Thanks that we can read it. Thanks that it is living. Please apply it to our hearts, minds, souls, lives, our desires, our ambitions, our understandings by your Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we know how we've gotten to this point, don't we? Uh, soon you'll be able to recite this paragraph of every one of my sermons back to me. Uh, Jesus is the man who is everything that God promised. He's the one who will deal with the broken state of the world through sin. He's the one who will rule the world as it should be. He's the one who will save humanity. Matthew has been very careful in this biography to build a picture, hasn't he? He's not rushed us, he's taken us slowly. He's shown us the genealogy. He's shown us what happens around his birth and the connection with the Old Testament. He's shown us Jesus' message and method. He's shown us what he can do and the reactions he produces. Matthew's shown us that this is the man people will follow, that he's bringing in God's kingdom. We know by this point that Jesus offers something that no other human being can offer, which means Jesus can look the devil in the eye and tell the devil to go away. We know that Jesus has gathered his disciples, the wholehearted student followers of Jesus, and he's taken them up on a mountain, and he's, it's the first training session for the season, so to speak. Uh, you've got that image in your mind of Jesus and the disciples and then this big crowd, get the geography straight, this big crowd looking in. And Jesus is teaching them about the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdom of God is entered by knowing your own heart, isn't it? We saw that two weeks ago, by knowing your poverty, that you are broken by sin. And it's entered by knowing our need that we need to be connected to Jesus because he's the only one who can tell the devil to go away. The kingdom has a unique culture, it's salt and light. Remember we looked at that last week? And it's a culture that's never really been seen in this world. But this kingdom poses a question, where does Jesus fit? Where does Jesus fit? I want you to cast your minds back eight weeks. I mean, sometimes it's a struggle to yesterday, but eight weeks, let's go to eight weeks. And remember in that first sermon, I encourage you to think about two people, a Jew who was living dispossessed and under Roman rule with all these promises that 
just seems so dusty. Or perhaps a, a Jew who decided to connect to Jesus and Matthew's written this biography for you. And as you sit and read this biography, the question you're going to be asking is, where does Jesus fit? Where do I slot him in? How does he connect with all this stuff God has done before? Is he something new? Is he something different? Is he something destructive? Where does he fit? Now, that's always been the question about Jesus. It's always the question at his time, where does he fit? What do you do with the law? Do you obey the law? Do you abolish the law? Do you keep the law? Do you hate the law? It was the question in the early church in the book of Acts, where do we fit Jesus? Question in the early church, where do we fit Jesus? It's the reason we have creeds today, they were developed because people go, where do we fit Jesus? It's a very important question because your answer to that question will affect who you think God is, won't it? It will affect who you think God is. It will affect that book in front of you that hopefully you've got open, the Bible. Depending on how you answer that question, it will affect whether you, how you view that book. It will affect whether you think you're going to get to the end of today or what your heart is going to think, how you respond to an affront or to praise. It will affect your sin, your salvation, your future, your desires. You see... Where does Jesus fit affects all those things. It's a slightly important question, isn't it? Where does Jesus fit? Now, as we dive in, and we're only going to look at four verses today, as we dive into this question of where does Jesus fit, we've got to keep two truths just kind of percolating around in our minds. The, the first is this. Let me read you a quote. Quote, Matthew 5, 17 to 20, are among the most difficult verses in all of the Bible. End of quote. I mean, what idiot wants to stand up and preach on that? Uh, that's from Don Carson. Now, if you know Don Carson, when Don Carson writes that, you kind of go, there's a lot more in this passage. This is an incredibly complicated passage. There are areas here that we will never dive to the depths of. So just keep that away in one part. Of the, the second part... Second truth we've got to allow percolating around is that we've got to let Matthew speak. Let Matthew be Matthew. Uh, let me illustrate. Uh, we come to a passage where Jesus says, I fulfill everything. Where do we immediately go? Well, I, I immediately go to Romans. And so then we get what Paul says we think Matthew should have said. But Matthew's writing Matthew. And so whatever else Matthew is saying here, we can understand it in Matthew. And shock horror, it's still the word of God. So we've got to let Matthew say what God is saying through him. Well, Jesus, I'm at point one on the outline. Jesus seems to know this key question floating around. Look there at verse 17, page 1455. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. He's dealing with an assumption, isn't he? We like to work on assumptions. Assumptions are comfortable because I can control them. They're my assumption. Uh, the assumption is this, that Jesus is bringing something completely new. What, whatever else Jesus is doing, it has no connection with the past. In fact, it abolishes the past. In fact, it, 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 it kind of crushes it up, throws it in the bin, burns it and does away with it. Whatever else Jesus is doing, it has no connection with the past. Uh, that's what Jesus is talking about with the law and the prophets, isn't he? That's his Bible. The law, that's the first five books. The prophets, they're those slightly scary men and women who came uh, to confront God's people. And when Jesus says the law and the prophets, he's saying the whole Old Testament and there's an assumption that Jesus has come to do something completely different to that. He's not connected to what God has already done. His answer is very clear. Did you see it in verse 17? Very clear. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I have a very clear answer. I'm not destroying them. But what does that actually mean? Not to destroy and to fulfill. I think the first thing we've got to get straight in our hearts and minds is, what was the purpose of the law and the prophets? And let me give you one. The law and the prophets were given so that I might know how to behave to such a level of goodness that God will say I'm okay. 
That's one way of treating them, isn't it? It's, it's kind of like having a checklist on your fridge that you tick off at the end of the day so you can sleep well. So you can present it to God and say, look, I've achieved the standard to be acceptable to you. But that's actually not how God uses it. And that's why we had that Exodus reading. That's why we had that Exodus reading. Uh, in the book of Exodus, uh, we know God's committed himself to a certain family, hasn't he? He's committed himself to the family of Abraham. He said back in Genesis chapter 12, through this family I'm going to deal with the sin of the world. I'm going to turn brokenness, curse, into blessing. So really that's the way of saying I'm going to deal with sin. And through the twists and turns of God's plans and the way God decides things, that family ends up in Egypt, don't they? And the Pharaoh goes, you little ripper, I've got a workforce. And so they're in slavery and in Exodus 2 they cry out to God and God answers them. He rescues them, doesn't he? That's an amazing rescue. It's a rescue that just completely dismantles everything the Egyptians thought about the world and shows them the truth. And after he's rescued them, where does he take them? He takes them to a very significant mountain, doesn't he? And he sits down and he has a chin wag with them. He gives them a constitution. I want you to notice something very clear about the chronology. They're saved first, aren't they? And then they're given the law. So the law, keeping the law, doing that checklist, ticking off the Ten Commandments, that had nothing to do with them being saved, didn't it? Because they're already saved. They're already free. They've already been brought out. So why does God give them the law? Well, he gives them the law because they've got a very important job. Did you pick it up as Mary was reading it in Exodus 19, verse 5? Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, here's the job, you'll be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Their job is to represent God to the world. Kind of what Joe Hockey's doing in America at the moment. He's our ambassador. Did you know that? Joe Hockey, our ambassador. He's representing Australia to the world. Well, that's the job of God's people, to represent God to the world. So God gives them the law after he saved them so they know who he is. So they faithfully represent him to the world. So the purpose of the law is for people to have a revelation of God so they can represent him to the rest of the universe. And that's what the prophets were about too, wasn't it? Because God's people didn't do that real well. And so the prophets are constantly calling God's people, come back to God so you can represent him to the world rightly. Come back to God because the consequences are horrific. And if you look at what happens there, as you unpack those first five books and then what happens later on, you'll see a certain pattern. Now, the pattern's very clear. It always begins with who? It begins with God. God looks at humans and goes, you are rebellious sinners, so I'm going to step in. You need me. So I commit out of my mercy and grace and love to do something about the mess you have made. In the face of human rebellion where a person like Bernard Gabbett says, I'll do a better job of being God than God, God says, I commit to this group of people to deal with their sin. That's the case right throughout the Bible, isn't it? Did you notice that in Genesis 3? We're going to look at Genesis next term, so you'll get random Genesis references over the next few weeks. But Genesis 3, what does God do when Adam and Eve sin? He comes into the garden. He commits. He comes and says to them, you have sinned and one of your descendants will deal with this thing called sin. It's the same pattern throughout the whole Bible. It begins with God committing out of his mercy and grace to do something for people who don't want him to do anything and he commits to dealing with their sin. So bring those two ideas together, the purpose of the law and the prophets and the pattern that they reveal. We then need to go, what does the word fulfill mean? 
Now, the word fulfill can mean all sorts of things, can't it? It can mean a description of a day's work or a decent meal or a relationship or a plan. How does Matthew use it? Well, if you've been listening over the last few weeks, you'll notice he uses that word a lot, doesn't he? Uh, Matthew 1, 22, 2, 15, 2, 17, 2, 23, Matthew 3, 15, Matthew 4, 14. Same word, fulfill, 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 fulfill. Uh, you can't miss it. Every time he uses it, what does he connect it with? The Old Testament, doesn't he? The law and the prophets. But he uses it in a very interesting way. He, he doesn't use it in the way I use it, which is um, there was a prediction about Jesus that he'd be born at 9am and put in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes, and shepherds would come. Tick that box. He's fulfilled it. He doesn't use it that way. Every time Matthew uses that word with the Old Testament, he doesn't use it about prediction. He uses it about pattern. Remember that pattern? God commits first, out of his mercy and kindness, to deal with human sin. And when you look through those fulfilled passages, that's what Matthew is saying. This bloke is about the pattern of God, the pattern by which God deals with humans, the pattern of God committing via a promise to deal with the sin of people who want nothing to do with him. So when Jesus says, I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets, it's a big statement, isn't it? He's come so that God can be revealed truthfully so that God's people can truthfully reveal God. He's come to show the pattern God uses where everything starts with God's merciful commitment to sinners. When Jesus says, I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets, he's saying he's the end point, the completion of the pattern and promise of God the end point and the completion of the pattern and promise of God. That's why he's come. And so when Jesus looks at the Old Testament in verse 18, what does he say about it? I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus looks at the Old Testament and goes, it stands, all of it. From Genesis to Malachi, it stands. Why does it stand? Well, it stands because a bloke called Jesus is walking around fulfilling it. It stands because it's God's word. It stands because Jesus does everything it set out as a promise and a pattern. And so Jesus then says, verse 19, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I'm at point two on the outline. Jesus seems to have learned a very good teaching method, repetition. So that's what he's saying, isn't it? Repeating the same point but personalising it, pointing out the consequences and the, the, the things that will happen if we don't pay attention. I actually don't think he's doing that. I actually think he's doing something much greater. Uh, look there at verse 19. Uh, they've actually left out a word. Uh, and it's not often I'll do this, but I, I think it's worth paying attention here. There's a therefore that should be there. Therefore anyone. You see, verse 19 is the consequence of verses 17 and 18. What Jesus says in verse 19 comes because Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. It, it, it maps out the consequence and I want you to notice something very important about verse 9. And what is Jesus talking about? Does the word law appear in verse 19? It's not there, is it? In fact, it's a completely different word. At verse 18, Jesus talks about the law, he uses the Greek word nomos, which is often used in the New Testament to describe the Old Testament law. But verse 19 he uses a different word. It's commandments, isn't it? Now, you always pay attention when Jesus changes words because that word is very important when you follow Jesus' work because when Jesus finishes, if we were listening to Mary's reading from Matthew 28 in the last sermon he gives, listen to what he says. 
Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Same, same word group. Jesus' first sermon, Jesus' last sermon, talked to his disciples about obeying his commands. What he says. Uh, because what is about to follow is his sermon on the law and the prophets, isn't it? That's what we're going to look at next week and in Matthew 6. And so on the one hand, Jesus is saying, where, where do I fit? I, I fit smack bang in the middle. I fulfill everything that has come before. And because I fulfill everything that has come before, you better listen to everything I'm about to command. I'm smack bang in the middle of all of history, of all of the plans, purposes, promises and patterns of God. I fulfill everything that has come before and because I fulfill everything that has come before, everything I'm about to say stands on par with that. So let me finish with a hand grenade because that's really what verse 20 is, isn't it? It's a theological hand grenade. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you'll certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. No, this is a consequence for, I mean, I don't know what kind of day it was on that mountain, but if someone dropped a pin, I reckon you could hear it at that point. I think Jesus is dealing with another assumption and he doesn't want it to take root. It's the assumption that's always informed the way people in their natural desires have dealt with God's words. He doesn't want this assumption to take root. He doesn't want people to confuse what he's saying with a new checklist. So you just whack it up there next to the Ten Commandments. You might need a bigger fridge. But you just keep ticking it off because Jesus is still on about being perfect in your behaviour. He doesn't want that assumption to take root because it's wrong. That's the assumption that has taken root, hasn't it? That's who the, the Pharisees and the scribes are, the religious lawyers, the ones who are so brilliant at tithing that they tithe their herbs, the ones who are still evident in the ten rabbis that came from my year at school who tore their toilet paper on a Friday so they never worked on a Saturday, who said getting into heaven, being right with God, is all about ticking the boxes. Jesus doesn't want that assumption to take root, does he? Because that assumption's wrong. Righteousness is not about your right behaviour. Righteousness is not about a record of your good and perfect deeds. That form of righteousness has misunderstood the purpose of the law and the prophets and misunderstood God's pattern and promise so Jesus lays out this theological hand grenade and says, I'm dealing with something much greater. Not new, but much greater. I'm dealing with righteousness as I've already told you it's all about. Because he has, hasn't he? Do you remember verses 10 and 11 from Matthew chapter 5? Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. What's righteousness? It's been connected to Jesus, isn't it? Because he is the only one who has told the devil to go away. That's always been God's pattern, promise and plan. To be righteous is to be connected rightly to God's pattern and promise, to be connected to Jesus who fulfills all that. And that is never going to happen if you look at a checklist on your fridge. Now, I think the disciples, I, I, I suspect their brains are just, well, perhaps like your brains at the moment, Marsh, who knows? I, I suspect they're completely and utterly bewildered. This goes against everything that they have been taught. But they know this, don't they? Because Jesus has already said it in verse, verse 3. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. They know the nature of their hearts, don't they? They know they are sinners. They know that their only hope of being in God's kingdom is being connected to the one person who can tell the devil to go away. That is their only hope. Now, before I wrap it up with a couple of ideas and points, I just want to give you a moment just to think about that. What we've learned about fulfill, what we've learned about the law and the prophets, what we've learned about all the commands and righteousness. I just want to give you a moment. I just want you to sit quietly for a moment. Roger Bannister was the hinge point for mile running. What Roger Bannister did, high school boys are doing now. He wasn't new, but he created something greater, didn't he? The old period of running and the new period of running. What was possible? Jesus is the cosmic hinge for all of history. He stands smack bang in the middle and fulfills everything that God promised and patterned and planned. And so whatever Jesus says and does is in line with what God has always purposed. This is the one who will deal with sin, rule rightly and save humans. This is the one who has brought righteousness, being connected to God's promises, plans and patterns. This is the one who brings righteousness like we will never achieve. Where does Jesus fit? Smack bang in the middle. The consequences are massive. Let me highlight four briefly. First, if we are going to deal rightly with God, rightly with his kingdom, rightly with God's world, rightly with our existence, it is a non-negotiable that we've got to deal with Jesus. We've got to deal with Jesus. He fulfills everything that God promised, patterned and planned. Whatever else I want to think, whatever else I want to assume, whatever else I want to say must happen, I've got to deal with Jesus. Second, the reality of Jesus and who he is means that I've got to deal with what he does with the Bible. The Old Testament matters. The Old Testament matters. It is relevant. It is true. It is God's revelation of his pattern and promise and plan of dealing with humans. It's how God lays the foundation for dealing with sin. It leads me to ask myself, how well do I know that Bible? Thirdly, it also means that Jesus self-consciously, willingly, publicly understands that what he says is on par with everything that God has already said. If Jesus is smack bang in the middle, fulfilling everything that comes before, that stands. And that means that everything that comes after stands as God's word, doesn't it? So from the in at the beginning of Genesis to the amen at the end of Revelation, it's all God's word. Finally, because of who Jesus is, as he stands smack bang in the middle, fulfilling and continuing, he reveals this truth about God. God is utterly consistent in his method and character in the whole of the Bible. It's not as if you've got an angry God and then a loving God. It's not as if you've got a judgmental God and a merciful God. It's not as if you've got a God of checklists and a God of grace. It's the same God who operates with the same method. He initiates promises and achieves through a pattern what we can never achieve. I don't know how those disciples were feeling. I suspect they felt a little bit like I did most of this week. Jesus fulfills the pattern, promise and plan of God. So the people like us can enjoy the mercy of God and be in his kingdom. Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. Uh, it's only four verses, but because it's your word, it takes us to the depths of our souls, uh, the heart of the universe. We could use all sorts of 
exaggerated language, but it's really quite simple. Jesus stands smack bang in the middle of history. He fulfills everything that you promised, planned and patterned. And what he commands and achieves and lives on our behalf, we must pay attention to. Father, help us to do business with him. Amen. Any questions? Oh, look at that. Andrew. Yeah, yeah. So Andrew's picked up something I did purposely, uh, which is leave out most of verse 19, okay? And uh, Andrew's asking me in one sentence, don't ever ask me in one sentence, like ask me in one point, uh, to uh, summarise what I think is going on. I think there are two things that stand out there. Uh, the first is uh, whatever you do with what Jesus commands, where are you at the end in the kingdom of God? I'm still trying to work out what that means, but I think it means at least this, whatever you do won't be beyond what God knows and will reveal. That's important. I think secondly, I think what Jesus is encouraging these 12 to do, because he knows what they're going to go out to do, is teach the whole picture, everything, because the consequences are massive. If we fiddle with the truth, Jesus won't be smack bang in the middle of history as people hear the good news. And that means their sins, well, they can't bring them to God through Jesus, can they? And so think very carefully if you're going to fiddle with the truth because the consequences are massive. At this point, that's a, does that answer your question? Yes and no, that's right. That's why we have morning tea, isn't it? <laughs> Any other questions? Neil's putting his hand up. Go for it, Neil. Yeah. Um, it, it's really, yeah. So, what and where doesn't mean everything is accomplished because that will then affect how we deal with the Old Testament and that kind of stuff. Is that, that what you're asking, Neil? Um, can I? I hate doing this, okay? But I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, it's really interesting in the Greek. <laughs> I know that sounds pretentious. It's really interesting in the Greek that the sentence that falls out actually falls out in a way that there's an equal sign between heaven and earth disappearing and everything being accomplished. So they're the same. Okay, And so Jesus is saying that everything being accomplished. Now, now when's that? When, when is everything accomplished? Now, in this week we know that because Revelation 21 tells us that there will be a day where there will be no tears. That's when everything is accomplished. And on that day, on that day, you can stop listening to the Old Testament because you will look God in the eye. Does that answer your question? Terrific. The other, th the other thing to pay attention to as well is um, verse 18, I tell you, verse 20, I tell you, same Greek phrase. So that's the, that's the truly, truly, I tell you, amen kind of stuff. Pay attention to those. They're really important.